<laughs> Welcome back. You made it. Class two. Uh, or one, I guess, depending on how we're indexing. So today we're going to talk about uninformed search, but we have some announcements. Are we live on YouTube? Uh, it looks like it. Awesome. There are fewer of you here, so I'm hoping they're somewhere else watching. Okay, announcements. Slides from lecture zero are up. Did you see those? Yes. Great. Also, slides from this lecture are up as of like 20 minutes ago. Can you see those? 10 minutes ago, yes. 10 minutes ago? Yes. yes. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, we have office hours now. Hooray. They start next week. Um, here is the schedule. You should know that these are not the same room. So pay attention to that. Uh, my office hours are Friday, 3 to 4 in my office, which is on the second floor, far west end of MEV. You should know that my office is pretty small. So if there are 30 of you there, uh, that may not work out so well, and we may not get there. Right. So keep that in mind. The TA's office hours are in very large rooms, is what I'm told. So sounds good. All right, more announcements. Quiz zero is live. Can you see that as of 10 minutes ago? Yes. Or maybe fewer than 10, maybe like eight minutes ago. Okay, great. It is extremely easy. All of the answers are in the slides today, and they're highlighted in a different color. <laughs> <laughs> this is mainly to make sure that you can take quizzes and the kind of the procedural aspects of this works. So do that after the lecture today, sometime before Friday tomorrow night at 11.59. The other thing, Project Zero is live. It is a kind of get Python working on your machine slash introduction to programming in Python project. Yes? So Project Zero says it's locked until 6 p.m. today. I think I changed that, but I will double check uh, in a little bit. Anyway, uh, we're doing Project Zero in Python 2.7. If you feel extremely strongly about Python 3, I did reach out to Berkeley and get Python 3 projects, but they are much less well tested and things like this. So I would really prefer if you did in 2.7, but if you feel really strongly about it, we can talk about it. Yes? Isn't Python 2.7 not supported anymore? Yeah, as of like yeah. 10 days ago, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, oh, nine days ago. Yeah. Uh, if you feel really strongly about Python 3, we can talk about it. So send me an email if that's the case. Okay. Great. Um, the next announcement. It has come to my attention that this class is approximately six years long every day. So we're going to take a very short break in the middle of it today, give people a chance to go to the restroom or whatever. Um, does that sound good? Is that reasonable? OK, great. That is when I will check on the project's uh, visibility for you all. Another announcement coming from the school. The school is looking for tutors for a new tutoring program. Um, if this interests you, and you meet the qualifications and feel like the responsibilities <coughs> listed here are something you would enjoy, apply there. Um, awesome. Okay, last time, we went over kind of the structure of the class, we went through the syllabus, we had a brief history of what AI is and where it's been, where it kind of is now, and we talked some about philosophy. Uh, we're gonna do much less waxing poetic about the philosophy of AI for the rest of this course with the exception of um, we are going to have an ethics associated with AI section near the end of the class, which is very important. So that's something to keep in mind. It's going to get more technical now. We're going to talk about uh, methods rather than kind of the philosophy behind it. OK, so today, we're going to talk about agents that plan ahead. We're going to do so with something called uninformed search, which includes methods like breadth-first search, depth-first search, and iterative deepening search, and uniform cost search. So how many people have seen BFS before? Awesome. And BFS? And the other two? Some? It's probably less likely, but you've seen variants of these under different names, I assure you. OK. Before we talk about agents that plan ahead, let's talk about agents that do not. So there's something called a reflex agent. And these are agents that choose actions based on what they currently perceive of the environment and maybe some memory of what they've perceived in the past. Um, they do not consider the future consequences of their actions. They instead consider how the world is right now. So this might fall under the umbrella of your sufficiently complicated sequence of uh, if statements that we were talking 
I'll ask that, for instance. Um, here's a question. Can a reflex agent be rational under the definition that we defined last time? Who thinks it can? Who thinks it cannot? Many people don't have an opinion. Uh, can you restate the definition? Okay. Um, rationality is acting in order to maximize your expected utility under some definition. Yeah, I think you can. We yeah. talked about how it uh, isn't really necessary to consider how an agent is making decisions, but rather to look at the results of those decisions. So for instance, we can have a reflex agent in the Pac-Man world, which again is gonna be what the projects are based on, that is just looking at what the closest dot is and trying to get to the closest dot that it sees, okay? So that would look something like this in this setting. Pretty good, right? Yeah. What happens though to a reflex agent if we make it a little more complicated? So let's see, That's this, this is the same agent. Looking for the closest dot with some tiebreakers and going toward that closest dot. Oh, it's trying to go right. It is, it's trying to go right because the closest dot is right and it doesn't really consider how it would get around that. So here, this agent is stuck in some kind of local minima, right? It wants to get closer to that dot. It can't do so right now. It doesn't have the ability to plan how to take an action that seems worse right now in order to increase its efficacy later, right? This is the problem. This is why we want agents that can plan ahead. So a planning agent is instead going to ask, what if? It's going to make decisions based on some hypothesized consequence of its actions. That means that it has to have some model of how the world's going to evolve as a function of its actions, right? And so it also needs to know, have I solved the goal? So we need some text for that. So this agent is gonna consider how the world would be um, given how it acts. So I do wanna talk about some definitions here. So uh, optimal versus complete. So a complete agent is one that's going to find a solution if it exists. But there's no notion of whether it's an optimal solution or some cost method. That might give you insight into what optimal means, which is that it finds the optimal solution, right? Or an optimal solution, because you can have multiple solutions that evaluate to the same cost, right? We just need one of those. Okay. There's also this notion of planning versus replanning. So an agent may plan its entire set of actions in advance in order to solve the problem, or it may look into some short time horizon in the future, execute those actions, and then replan as it goes, right? So let's look at kind of what that might look like in the same Pac-Man world. So here we have an agent that does replanning. So it's looking into some finite time horizon, but it is planning in that horizon. So this will be able to get out of local minima if they're shallow enough, I guess. Okay, let's see what happens. So what if instead we have the agent plan the entire thing in advance in an optimal way? So that's what this is going to do. Now the problem here is that it's got a lot of computation to do, right? Uh, we'll talk about how this state space looks uh, in a little bit, but it's big. This agent has to consider a lot of different ways to act, and um, it has to consider a lot of it in order to find an optimal solution. In fact, it is considered a few thousand uh, actions here. But then, once it starts going, it's wasting no movement, right? This is the, uh, the optimal solution for this. It knows to stop at the dead end, uh, et cetera. So in order to look at how we're gonna make agents that do this, we need to kind of define what uh, the search problem looks like. So a search problem consists of a state space, a 
successor function, so this is actions, costs associated with those actions, and a way that the actions modify the world around it. A start state and a goal test, because there might be multiple goals in the state state. <coughs> and then what we're trying to find is a solution, which is a sequence of actions, we can call that a plan, which transforms the start state into the goal state. So search problems are models of the world that the agent is attacking. So a rational agent acts based on what it perceives in order to maximize its utility level. So we're going to define this notion of problem a little more formally here. So we have some set of state S. We have an initial state that is in that set. We have a set of actions A. We have some transition function that takes a current state in an action and maps it to a new state. Right? We have some goal test. This is a function of the states that produces uh, true or false. Is this the goal or is it not for a goal or not? And then we have some cost function, which defines costs over actions. So this is the more formal definition of search problem that we're going to use in this class, and it's this two bullet these states. So search happens in simulation with this model. This is really important. If we have, if we're using search to plan motions for a robot, for instance, we don't have the robot searching over the set of possible actions by actually moving in the world. It is doing this in simulation in advance, and then once it finds a solution, that is the thing that we execute. Right? This is probably obvious by now, but we're not talking about web search. So um, that's a different class entirely. Okay, so what are some examples of search problems? So let's say that we're in Romania and we want to travel from Murad to Bucharest. So we have some abstraction of the world, that's this map. And so we can define the search problem as a model here. So we have the state space. What are the state spaces here? Or what are the states here? Cities. Cities, yes. What in this abstraction are the successor functions? That's right, the rows that go between one city to another. And we may have some cost associated with the distance. It doesn't have to be the distance, it could be the amount of gas required to do so, or something like this, right? We have some start state, I mentioned that already. And we have a goal test. Are we in Bucharest? Right? So then the goal of the search problem is to produce some solution or an optimal solution. But this doesn't have to be something that's as easily mapped to this abstraction as a map. We can talk about something, for instance, like Sudoku. So in Sudoku, we have some set of states. Let's call those all legal Sudoku boards. We have some start state. That's a partially filled in board. We have actions. Those actions can be inserting a number into the board. And we have some goal test. And that's where all the cells are filled with some number, and we meet the constraints associated with Sudoku. We have some cost function, which may be you know, one per addition of number. Right? So then we can use the same search strategies that we used to plan our route through Romania to solve Sudoku. There's other examples. We can look at how do we plan flights. Uh, we have states that are airports. We have some start state, we have some goal state, and actions, which are available flights, right? And then we can have some cost, which is the money required by the airline in order to get it from one place to another. This is an extremely powerful abstraction. That's what I'm trying to get at. There are many, many different problems that you can apply to this, or that you can, yes, apply to this. And so, let's think about some more. So I'd like you to discuss for a few minutes, like we did last time, some other ideas for problems that we might be able to solve this. So, let's do that now. <laughs>
So, what would your states be? Uh, predefined sound bites that match known words. So, some kind of so you have like a waveform signal of words. words, some kind of dictionary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would your actions be? No. Manipulating the source wave into your possible predefined. So some kind of editing of some sequence of these words in this dictionary. Uh, and so then your cost might be the amount of manipulations you'd have to make to the source wave for it, like edit a sentence or something. And then how would you know you're at the goal? Whoa, oh, that's not how that word word is spelled. You read it down in your dictionary. So it sounds in the dictionary. Yeah, or close enough. Well, close enough, I like that. Close enough is, is where we live. Okay, great. <laughs> um, how about another example? Yes? Just uh, optimizing traffic patterns. Traffic patterns. So what's your state? Uh, lights uh, at particular intersections are on or off. Lights uh, on or off. And your actions? So one set of cars, maybe or, or an average of all cars? I think it's average of all is better. You're just trying to minimize the average stop time for any average other Average stop car. time of all cars, maybe? So what's your goal? Making the average stop time small as possible. So small as possible, that's difficult, right? You don't know yeah, what is possible. Like hard, oh, this is, this is where we're at, let's do it. Right, well, that's an interesting question. Do we need a goal in order to do search? Yeah. No. <laughs> so you could just expand in your space, keeping track of the best in town. The goal could be what? I'm sorry. The lowest possible cost. Lowest possible cost. But you need to know what that cost is in advance. Yes. Could we say that the goal is to have cost zero, and then whether or not you reach it, you just try and get as close to it as possible? That's a great point. So is there utility in searching but not finding in that case? Right? What if you're keeping around the best? Then you found so far, yes. So I think that's a useful thing to think about, using the search abstraction for optimization, where you don't necessarily have a predefined goal or a way to test for the goal. Uh, under our pretty narrow definition of search, I think this probably falls a little bit outside of it, but um, that's certainly a useful thing to do and a useful thing to think about. Let's do one more. Does anybody have something very different? The rod setting problem. Rod setting problem. What is the rod setting problem? Where you have a rod and you have to make a certain number of cuts in there, and each length uh, comes with a price that you can sell. 
and the idea is to try to maximize the amount of money. Okay. So you're maximizing retail of some set of cut rates. Right? Mm -hmm. So this might have the same issue that we have with the traffic pattern, right? Where there's no, do you know in advance the optimal cost? Um, no. It might. Uh, I have the same problem. Let's talk about what the states would be. What are the states? Um, ways that the rod is cut. Okay, so uh, instances of cuts. And so your actions then? I cut them further. Okay, so varying where you <coughs> plan to cut. Okay. And then the cost is probably defined in the cost of doing something else. Awesome. Yeah, these are great examples. Uh, the point is that this is a very versatile, flexible, and powerful expansion, right? So let's talk a little bit, yes? Would the traffic patterns and the rod based model be optimization rather than search? So uh, yes, I would say that they are optimization. Uh, the relationship between search and optimization is blurry in this case. Um, you can conceptualize optimization as the search for the optimal setting of whatever is your optimizing. Um, you can utilize concepts from search to do optimization, which is what we were talking about. Um, yeah, they're definitely not identical to each other under the definitions that we just described here. So let's talk a little bit about the difference between world state and search state. So the world state includes every last detail of the environment, whether or not you feel it's relevant or not. The search state keeps only the details needed for planning around. And so this is where the abstraction comes in. So in our uh, Bucharest example, the world state would be the world, right? Do you need to know the state of the anthill that's in between two of these rows in order to do planning? Probably not, right? But you might need to know the length of the roads or where there are roads. So the right answer falls somewhere in the middle between including every possible detail and no details. That's probably pretty obvious. Um, but the point is it's the abstraction. So let's talk about a specific kind of problem, which is, which is pathing. So if we look at this uh, example of Pac-Man, say we want to go from one position to another position. That's the problem. Uh, that we'll call pathing. And so the states there would be Pac-Man's X and Y locations, right? The set of actions that Pac-Man can take are to go north, south, east, or west. The successor function is going to update that location, right? So you take some state, some current position, you apply north or south or east or west to it, right? And that updates that man's current location. So there's some goal tests, right? Which is, is the current state of path men at the place we were trying to be? What if we had a different problem though, which is a little more complicated? Say that we want to eat all the dots in the world. This is the goal of path men, right? Well, what are our states now? We want to keep around where pac is, that's relevant. We also need to know what's the state of all the dots, right? These can be represented as booleans in each of the dots positions, right? We still have the same actions. We have a different successor though. We need to update our location, which is like the last one, but we also probably need to, uh, in many cases, update whether or not the dot has been eaten, right? Which updates the, the state of the, of the world there. So then our goal test is, are all the dots eaten, right? It's worth noting at this point that you need to be very careful about how in code you're representing uh, this kind of stuff because if you represent the dots in less ideal ways, then uh, updating these data structures can be used to take a lot of time. So that's something to keep in mind. But let's talk about the size of your state space. So let's look at this example here. So here we have a very simple Pac-Man problem. Pac-Man can exist at one of 120 different positions. We have 30 dots that we're trying to eat. We have two ghosts that each exist at one of 12 positions, and the agent can be facing one of the four directions, right? Pac-Man can be facing one of the four directions. So how many states do we have in the world? Well, let's look at it. So Pac-Man can be in one of 120 different places. Right? 
But we also need to keep uh, around the state of the dots, right? So how many different possible dot configurations are there? Two to the 30, right? And for each one of those, Pac-Man can be in a different spot. We also need to keep around where the ghosts are, right? And then where the agency. This is a pretty big number, right? You might not have time to look at all of these. Right? So this is why we need to be very careful. So what are the states required for pathing, though? That's just 120, right? What about for eating all the dots? We don't really need to care about where the ghosts are, right? In this specific abstraction, um, and we don't really need to care about which direction Pac Man is facing, right? So the point is that if you're smart about how you are representing your search space, uh, you can prune this very, very large world space down into a much more reasonable number. Okay, so now let's talk about state space graphs and search trees. So the state space graph is a mathematical representation of a search problem. So, how many people have heard of the graph, the data structure, the abstraction? Okay, good. If you have not seen graphs before, that should give you pause. Uh, that's a, kind of a prerequisite for this kind of stuff. Okay. So, in this graph, the vertices are going to be the world configurations, and the edges are going to represent uh, an evolution of the world in some way, the results of an action, right? Then, the goal test is going to be, am I currently in one of the gold nodes, which are all going to be vertices, gold vertices in the graph, and there may be more than one, there may only be one. So it's really important to note that in a state space graph, each state occurs only once. There may be many different paths from one state to another, but each state only exists once. As we mentioned last time, this is a giant graph, probably, for any reasonably complex problem. So, we rarely or never build this explicitly in memory. We always look at this as an implicit construction. But it's a useful way to kind of think about the problem. So uh, kind of a review more formally of what graphs are. A graph is a set of vertices and edges where the vertices are nodes uh, like this, and the edges are transitions between them. These edges can be directed, in which you can only go in one direction, or undirected, in which you can go in either direction. And that would be a directed graph or an undirected graph. This should definitely be reviewed. Okay, so let's look at a state space graph. Here is a graph, right? We have all these states. We have some start state S, we have some goal state G. We have a set of different transitions we can take through this graph, right? And we want to find a path from S to G through the graph. This is a laughably tiny graph for a laughably tiny search problem. We should all be laughing at this tiny graph. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, for this graph, we could construct the search tree. Now, this is generally where we're going to be searching in uh, when we talk about search in this context. So what is a tree? A tree is a special kind of graph. It's a connected <coughs> acyclic graph. And connected means that there is a path between every pair of nodes. Acyclic means for any two vertices, there's only one path, right? I'll repeat. Okay, so what does the search tree look like for that laughably small graph we have? Looks like this. Okay, so this is an extremely important point. Every node in the search tree corresponds to an entire path in the problem graph. That means that nodes can appear in multiple locations, right? So you can see, for instance, G, the goal, is in multiple places, right? They're distinguished by their path. Again, this is at least as bad as the graph was itself. So we almost never construct this explicitly, right? Okay, so let's consider this graph. We have a start, we have a goal, we have two intermediate states. You can go between them, and you can go from the start and the goal to that. Here's a question for you to discuss. How big is this search tree? Starting at S. I was going to say take a couple minutes to discuss it, but yeah, good point. It's infinitely large, right? 
Because from every A you can go to B, and from every B you can go to A, and you can just keep going down forever, right? Yes, it's a vicious cycle when you die. So it's important that in many search trees, there's a lot of repeated structure. Okay, so let's talk about how we search over a tree. So we start with our start node, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna expand the tree one node at a time. I wanna define something called a frontier. This is a set of nodes that we've seen over the course of the search but haven't yet expanded. Okay, that's an important difference. So the key to a search algorithm is which node do we expand next? So there are some important uh, quantities associated with the tree. One is the branching factor. That's the breadth, you should, see this, should have seen this before. As well as the maximum depth, right? Or the depth that you're currently at. There's also this notion of a minimum solution depth. So that is the minimum depth at which there exists a solution, right? For a node that's in the goal set. Okay, so how many leaves are in a search tree of breadth B and depth B? Yeah, right, it's, it's not a fully well-defined orthogonal structure, right? Well, there's on the order of B to the B um, in this case. Okay, so generally, uh, here's some pseudocode for what a tree search looks like in the book. Did anybody do the reading? Did everybody do the reading? Everybody did the reading, right? <laughs> awesome. So you have seen this and a much more detailed version of this. So when we're searching over a tree, the important ideas here are how are we handling the frontier? How are we expanding? Um, and what is the strategy when we do that expansion? So the main question here is which frontier nodes do we explore and when? Okay, so we're talking today about uninformed search. So this means you know next to nothing about where the solutions are in the tree. So what do we do? Well, we have a variety of different options. We could expand the deepest node that we've seen so far, right? This is depth first search. We could instead expand the shallowest node that we've seen that we haven't yet expanded. This is breadth first search, right? <coughs> what are the properties that we want out of a search algorithm? I mentioned that we want completeness, right? This is the notion that the search finds a solution if one exists. It'd be nice if it stopped, if the solution didn't exist, right, at some point. We want potentially a notion of optimality, that's finding the lowest cost path under some definition of cost. And we also need to care about what the time complexity is, which we can conceptualize here as the total number of nodes that we visited, as well as the space complexity, which is the size of the frontier. Because the frontier is the thing that we're keeping around in memory. Okay, so let's talk about depth first search. So this is expanding the deepest node first. This is super important if you care about quiz grades. The implementation of the frontier here is a last in first out step. Right, so we're gonna keep around, we're gonna be pushing things onto the stack as we see them, we're gonna be popping them off of the stack as we want to expand them. This is the data structure that we'll use for the frontier. Now you can also implement depth first search recursively um, very easily, uh, but let's now pretend that we're doing this uh, with the explicit data structure for the frontier. Okay, so let's start at S here. So we push S on the stack, we pop S off the stack, so the only one in the stack, and then we look at its neighbors, right? And we're gonna push all those onto the frontier. So that's E, E, and P here. Then we're gonna, well, we'll go right up. E, E, and D, right? Then we're gonna pop D off, okay? We look at its neighbors. We push those onto the stack, E, C, and D, after we check whether that was the goal. It wasn't, so we'll keep going. Okay, and then we continue, right? You've seen this before. We reach A, A doesn't have any outgoing edges, so it's a weak node, so we have to stop there. So then we go back, we pop something else off the stack, that's C, it also goes to A, stop there, and we continue on, right? So is this algorithm guaranteed to find a solution if one exists? Is it optimal? What's the time complexity, what's the space complexity? These are gonna be the things that we wanna know, right? So to answer these questions, let's look at kind of a cartoon drawing of what a search tree looks like. So here we have our root. We have this branching factor B, right? We're gonna get deeper. So at each layer, we have uh, some function of B, right? We have one node at the top, we have B nodes in the second layer, we have B square nodes in the third layer, etc. 
Say we have m tiers to this tree. Uh, well, let's say we have d tiers to this tree, and I'll fix this later. At the bottom, we have d to the d node, right? Okay. But we have solutions that exist at various depths, right? So the problem is to find one of those. So what are the number of nodes in the entire tree? Right? Summation of every layer. Okay, but that's on the order of B of the D, so we'll just call it B of the D. Um, so, what nodes is that first search expanding? Because that's how we're going to consider the, the time complexity. Right? Well, it's kind of going down the left side of this tree as we were doing, right? And so we're covering this volume, this volume, until we find some solution. And this is with some notion of leftness, right? So, we're finding the leftmost solution. Leftmost is rarely a useful kind of solution. Uh, so this might not be the best, we'll get into that in a minute. The point is, that in the worst case, we could end up processing this entire tree, right? And in fact, if our solution is on the right side, but even at the second tier, we'll expand almost the entire tree in order to find it, right? Okay, so if, uh, wow, I need to fix this M. If D is finite, this takes on the order of B to the D time, right? How much space, though, does the frontier take? So this is the space complexity of this algorithm. Well, we're only keeping track of the siblings on the path to the root, right? Those are the only ones that we've pushed on that we haven't talked about. And so that's going to be on the order of B times D, which is really not so bad. So question for you, is this algorithm complete? Will this find a solution if one exists? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> But the tree could be infinitely deep, right? We saw that cycle. We didn't account for that cycle in that last graph. Uh, depending on what order we're pushing things onto this stack, we could go on forever, right? So under some assumptions, such as finite depth, um, or if we're keeping track of the nodes that we visited in a smart way, yes, it's complete. Is it optimal? No. Definitely not. As I mentioned, it finds the leftmost solution, which is usually not the best most solution, right? Okay. So let's look at the other of these two algorithms here. Breadth first search. So the strategy here is to expand the shallowest node first, right? And this we're going to use by implementing the frontier as a queue data, right? So the first in, first out. Okay, so what does that look like on this graph? We start with S and push uh, D, E, and P onto the queue. In that order, then we uh, will pop D off, then E, then P, et cetera, right? And so what we're doing is we're searching by tiers. We're completely exhausting one tier and then moving on to the next, right? Okay, so let's look at the complexity here. What nodes is BFS gonna expand? Right, it's gonna go down the tiers. So then it's processing all the nodes that are above the shallowest solution. So if we let that depth be S, then the search time takes on the order of b to the s plus one. Why, where is this one coming from? It's the first node. It is the children of the last layer that we're on, because they've been pushed onto the, the queue at this point, right? So we have to operate on them because each node is dominating, the, each layer is dominating the previous layer, we have to consider that, right? How much space does the frontier take, though? Yeah. Roughly, it's the last year's children, right? And so that's B to the S plus one. That's much worse than that first search was, right? Is this complete? Yes. Yes. Uh, assuming that you don't have an infinite branching factor, which is much rarer than an infinitely deep tree. Uh, but if you're working in continuous spaces, you might run into that. You have to be careful, but um, yes. S must be finite if a solution exists, so it'll see it, right? Is it optimal? No. So it depends on what your cost is, right? So if you assume that all costs or transition here are uniform, then it is optimal. But if they can vary, then it's not. Okay, so this reiterates that. Um, the important part here is that BFS is better than DFS in 
all respects except for the cost in memory. Right. Okay, so in what kind of instances would you want to use one or the other? Does anybody have any ideas? Yes. Sure. Uh, both will tell you whether the path exists. Um, breadth research will probably do it faster in most cases. But um, it depends kind of where in the tree the solution is in. Right? As you, I think, are pointing out, when you, the solution is kind of to the left and it's buried very deep, um, depth per search is going to be better. But we can't know in advance. That's the problem. Right? So let's look at how BFS and DFS um, perform kind of on a very toy, simple example. So here we have some kind of maze, right? Let's say that it's a rowboat in water and you can't go through the black regions, but you can go through the blue and you're trying to go from green to red, right? So let's look at how DFS, depth per search, behaves here. Does that make sense? So this is the path it found. It's gonna go across this meandering green path. It found one. Right, but that's probably not optimal. Let's look at what BFS would look like in contrast. Oops. Right. So this is optimal, assuming that it's a uh, constant cost to move here um, to mitigate some stuff. It might have taken longer, so it's hard to say. Um, the question becomes, can we combine these two things to get the best of both worlds? So the problem with DFS is that it's not optimal. It's not necessarily complete, uh, depending on what these measures in the trees. Um, in both cases, that's because it fails to explore other alternatives as it goes. So let's talk about something called iterative deepening. So the way this is gonna work is we're gonna run DFS to a fixed depth. We're gonna start at one. If no solution exists, we're gonna increment it and then rerun it to a deeper, right? Okay. So iterative deepening here uses DFS as a subroutine. And basically you're just going to look at the depth of DFS as you go, but you're going to still search in a DFS way. So you're going to search this volume here, you're going to restart and search this, this, and this, um, and so on, until you find a solution. This is um, iterative deepening search. Is this optimal for constant cost? Yes. Are we searching from the root or like searching from the bottom of what we last searched. So you're searching from the root because you have to be really careful about keeping track of things you visited before, which we'll touch in a second. That seems like it wouldn't be a good idea, right? Um, how can that be a good idea, in fact? The problem is that it's duplicating work. But it has a much lower memory requirement, um, and it's not expanding that many more nodes than DFS will. Uh, and that's because the nodes at depth m plus one are much, much more than the nodes at depth m. Right, so you get this value. Yes? Is the only like, uh, reason you use DFS is for space optimization? Yes, exactly. So the whole point of this is that we want the space complexity of DFS, but we don't want it to take forever. Right? And we also want an optimal solution. So, <laughs> well, we kind of skipped that over, but. Is this optimal for a constant cost? Who says yes? Who says no? Who doesn't have an opinion? Okay, <laughs> it is. It is optimal for a constant cost. Does anybody have any idea how we could go about maybe constructing the shadow of a proof for that? Yeah. I mean, it kind of feels like breadth first search a little bit. Like, it, it essentially does the, each iteration is just going further in breadth That's in a different kind of direction, if that makes sense. Right. So DFS is complete for finite depth, right? And we've made it finite by limiting the depth explicitly. And the optimal cost is going to exist at some depth, right? And so the depth of the, the minimum depth that has a goal is going to be the optimal goal, 
right? Because the cost is exactly the debt, right? So if you're complete to a debt and you search the debts in order, then you're gonna be honest, right? That's not a very formal proof, it's kind of a sketch for how that might work, yes? If you do not have an infinitely deep tree, uh, the tree is acyclic, right? So you're going to push every node on once. You're going to. Yes? Is the tree not cyclic in that robot example? The tree we're constructing from the graph that is cyclic is not cyclic in the robot example. But we do have to keep track of where we've been before. Is the robot not allowed to read back around? Yeah, so that's that's the point. We have to keep track of where we've been, which is I think what you're pointing out, right? We definitely don't want to allow it to go back to places it's already been um, on the optimal solution. Right? But the tree is a way to construct that optimal solution that doesn't have that problem. Make sense? So those cycles in the graph that are the robot going in a circle correspond to infinite depth in the tree. They don't correspond to parts of the tree in a finite set. Right. So we keep the tree from going infinitely um, by keeping track of where we've been. This isn't a problem. If we use DFS, which works on infinitely deep trees, this also isn't a problem. Right. Does that make sense? Okay. okay, from the textbook, in general, iterative deepening search is the preferred uniform search method when the state space is large and the depth of the solution is unknown. Okay. So up until now, we've had this constant cost on these transitions, right? What happens if we have a weighted graph? I'm sorry? <laughs> so something <laughs> almost exactly Dijkstra's algorithm, but different in a couple of key ways. Uh, a star will be next slide. Okay, so what happens if we run VFS on this? It's gonna find the path that requires the fewest number of actions, but not necessarily the optimal path with respect to cost, right? So we're gonna introduce something called uniform cost search, which is, what we're gonna do is we're gonna sum costs along each path, and we're gonna expand the cheapest node first. Not the first one we saw, not the most shallow one, not the deepest one, the cheapest one. And then we're gonna maintain the frontier as a priority queue, right? Again, if you care about quizzes, Okay. <laughs> All right, so how would that look on this graph, which is the same graph we had previously, but now it has costs? Okay, so we're at S. We're gonna go to the cheapest child, right? <coughs> That's P. P has one outgoing edge, and it's very, very expensive, right? 15, we add it to the one. Um, that's gonna be the key value for the priority queue um, for that instance of P. Yes? So the frontier is the children of the node that we've seen, the children of the expanded nodes. Any node that existed in the data structure and has been popped off the data structure or taken out of the data structure, um, its children are put there. All right, does that make sense? Okay, so it's all the nodes that we've seen from a node that we've been standing. You can kind of conceptualize it like if I'm standing in a place I can see all the next available actions, but not the ones available from there. Does that make sense? Okay, so we explored P, P had one child that was very expensive to get there. So we're gonna back up and we're gonna say what's the next lowest cost node in our tree, or in our priority queue, and that's D, right? So then we pop D out, we look at all of its children and push them on uh, with P's associated with how expensive it would be to get there, considering how expensive it was to get to D. Does that make sense? Okay, so then we're gonna take out the next cheapest one, that's B. B has one edge to A. A is on the in the priority queue now, but it's not the cheapest. That's E, right? So we're gonna add E's children. We're gonna continue on looking at the cheaper, cheapest and cheapest ones, right? At some point we find the goal. Right? So the key here is that similar to how BFS is exploring each layer of the tree. Uniform cost search is exploring layers, but this, it's these cost contours in the tree, right? So it's exploring everything, it has already explored everything with a cost less 
than its current home. Right? Make sense? Okay. So when you're expanding a node, you add results um, to the frontier only if they're not in the list of things you visited, or if they're already in the frontier but with a higher cost, you replace that cost. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's talk about this priority queue. So we have this key value, right? It's the total path cost up to that point. We expand the path with the lowest key value. Um, this works pretty well. Okay, so let's talk about the complexity here. So what nodes does, UC does UCF expand? So as I mentioned, it's these cost contours, right? So it's gonna process all of the nodes with the cost less than the cheapest solution, right? This is much more difficult to kind of to formalize mathematically, but the idea is that if we have some optimal cost C star, and each edge costs at least some value epsilon, then we have this notion of an effective depth, which is rough, roughly C star over epsilon. Um, it's gonna take on the order of one plus that uh, as the exponent to be here, similar to the other. Does that make sense? Okay, so how much space is the fringe of the frontier taking? Here. Roughly the last tier, right? Kind of similar to DFS. Is it complete? Assuming the best solution has a finite cost and the minimum edge cost is positive, then yes. If you have zero or negative edge costs, then no. Is it optimal? Yes. Okay. So remember that it's exploring increasing cost contours. So what are the good things about this? As we mentioned, it's complete and it's optimal. What are the bad things about this? Well, it's kind of exploring in every direction, right? It has no notion of moving toward the goal. If you have some start state, you can imagine that this is searching out in some volume, some cost volume, right? Okay, we will make that smarter in the next class but let's look at how this behaves when we have cost. Okay, so let's go back to the other algorithms that we have, DFS and DFS first. Let's modify our simple maze example here, and we're gonna say that the dark blue regions have three times the cost of the light blue regions, right? So what does DFS do? Doesn't care at all about the cost, so it returns the same thing, right? How about VFS? Doesn't care at all about the cost. Right, it does the same thing. This used to be the optimal path, but now it is not. So let's look at what um, UCF does. UCF. This is gonna look a lot like DFS as it goes, it's kind of expanding this volume. But since the cost is a little more complicated, you saw that it kind of slowed down the expansion in the higher cost regions, while it was still expanding pretty quickly in the low cost regions, right? And it does find the optimal cost which takes a larger number of steps to do, um, but is lower cost, right? So let's talk about this data structure issue. So all these algorithms are basically the same, except for how we're dealing with the frontier, right? So you can say conceptually <laughs> that a stack, a queue and a priority queue are all priority queues, depending on how you find priority, right? Um, but practically speaking, for DFS and DFS, you should be using stacks and queues unless you're doing DFS or curves. Right. But then for UCS, you should still be using third. Okay, if you're smart about it, you can even have one implementation that's taking a function or taking a queuing object, right? That's good enough. Okay, so real quick, we talked about this search operating over models of the world, right? It's not actually planning in the real world. Uh, that would be too difficult. It's planning in simulations. So your search is really only as good as your model. So if your model's not very good, that can be a problem, right? So let's look at some examples of that. So here we have like a MapQuest route, right? And it's trying to get you to drive on this sidewalk here because it had this sidewalk as a road in its model. It's obviously not good, right? It's a bad model. How about this? You're trying to go from one point in Norway to another point in Norway, and you found yourself going through London. <laughs> Probably not reasonable, right? Water I'm not sure what it was doing, but it wasn't doing it well. <laughs> Possibly because there are, so like, I guess because as far as, far, as, far as the program we were, there were no roads leading from point A in Norway to the rest of Norway. Maybe, maybe that's the case. Maybe it thought that ferries were free and the roads in London were cheaper, or the roads 
in England were cheaper for some reason? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they were negative cross varying. I don't know. There's something wrong with the model. That's the bottom line, right? So you're only as good as your model. That's a really important point. Okay. So what time is this class in? 145? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna talk very briefly about an application for this on the chalkboard, but let's take five minutes while I get that set up. Um, <coughs>
So why don't we, we'll talk about that a little bit later in the course, how you would deal with that in a different way, but for now, let's just discretize the space, right? And I don't know if I drew it in such a way that we can get there, but um, we have some discretized space, right? We have some start state. We have some notion of a goal state. We can start searching on this state. Right? So if you conceptually connect adjacent nodes to each other, right, and maybe don't allow connections actually to squares that contain your couch or your grandmother, <laughs> right, then this problem, going from the start state to the goal state, is exactly the search problem we were talking about before with um, Pac-Man. Yes? How are we talking about the Luma know where your grandmother is? Okay, so let's assume that the generic robot vacuum has some full knowledge of the world in this case. Uh, that alone is pretty unrealistic, but okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's fair. Um, in not the first time I talked about that, we'll, this we'll talk about how you deal with things like moving obstacles and stuff like that. Right? But um, for now, we could say that, let's say that Roomba can sense or generic vacuum robot can sense some radius around it with something like a connect sensor, for instance, right? And so you have some finite horizon and distance and you can plan that finite horizon and then it looks a lot like that when you're planning the problem that we started with, right? Does that make sense? So the question you might be asking yourself is, this is a pretty toy example, right? Does this concept abstract to more interesting robot problems? It does, that's the good news. Um, Let's talk about another toy problem, but a slightly more interesting toy problem. Let's say you have... Let's say you have some manipulator robot that lives in the chalkboard, right? It's a sad, lonely world in the chalkboard, but that's where it is. It's got two joints, one right here and one right here, and it can rotate around these joints, right? Here's a uh, gripper. <coughs> right? This is a much different looking robot problem than this one, right? But maybe it's not so different after all. Let's talk about something called a configuration space.
So let's set up a 2D world for this robot that looks similar to what we had in the past. Let's say that the setting of this rotational joint is theta 1, and the setting of this rotational joint is theta 2. And let's say that this dimension on this plane here is theta 1, and this dimension is theta 2. Then you can imagine that some point on this plane corresponds to some setting of the robot in its world on this plane, right? You have some instance of theta 1, some instance of theta 2, that's this point. That's some setting of these joints over here, right? So we can map then a point in this space to its configuration in the world in this space. So then maybe we can discretize this space and do similar things. That's what we were doing last time. But this space looks a little different, right? Um, these are rotational values. Let's say that it's allowed to spin through itself, then you can actually move this point off this end, right? And it comes up here, right? Similar in this direction, right? It'll reappear over here. Um, goes in both directions, right? So some kind of different rotational space. This actually, in this example where you have two degrees of freedom here, the rotational spaces, does have a real world shape analog. Can anybody tell me what this looks like when it's not flat from the board? Who says sphere? Oh, shit. No, I don't. <laughs> a lot of people say sphere. <laughs> Let's think about it for a second. So do we have an analog for a sphere that's been flattened that we look at all the time? Uh, yeah. Yes, a map of the globe, right? Does a globe, does the map of the globe behave this way? No. If you walk through the North Pole, do you end up in Antarctica? <laughs> I don't, I've never been there, but I don't think so. <laughs> yes, exactly. Who said that? Yes, perfect. Yeah, so a torus is a donut, if you're not familiar. That's what this looks like in real. Anyway, so you can use the same concepts to go from some start state. Maybe that's where this robot is picking something up here, right? To some goal. Maybe that's where it's then set it down over here. And you can do search over this space in exactly the same way we're doing search over that space in order to find the solution. Yes? So those, that's a map of angles, but it's two different settings or more could map the same position in the real world. Right? What does position mean? Um, so an x and y coordinate in the real world could not necessarily be one to one with the two so angles that we have. So an x to y coordinate of what in the real world? Like height and. So this is just a position in space, right? It's x and y. So that's nothing to do with the robot. Do you mean like where the robot's gripper is? Yeah. So I'm saying the world? that um, the gripper could be could go for x and y, but yes. it could get there with different angles. That's correct. Um, yes. And so I don't know if the map of saying that that is the start position on the angle graph would make more sense. So this is just a setting of two angles, right? These are a unique point here. Every point on here is going to map to a unique robot shape in the world. But there are going to be multiple points on here that map to a place, potentially multiple places on there, that map to a place where the gripper is holding this. Gotcha. Okay. Right? So then that S could be in multiple places. Like yes. Right. So, well, S generally, let's say we know that because it's where the robot is right now. Okay. But oh, the goal... The of the robot, not the thing you're tracking. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The goal, though, could be some region, right? There could be multiple disconnected regions. Yeah. Right. Anyway, the point is that you can discretize this space in a similar way, you can do search over it. Right? But the problem is that we have these obstacles in the way, potentially. So let's say that there's something, well that's never going to work, but if it's a little shallower, something right here in the plane that you can't run into, and you also don't want it to run through the ground, right? well, you can still use search, right? you can just check whether the grid positions you're in are ones in which the robot's colliding with the thing you don't want it to do. Since you're doing this whole thing in simulation, you don't actually have to run the robot into anything, right? Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so... This is one of the things that I work on, is planning motions for robots. They almost never are two-dimensional problems. Um, let's say that this robot had three joints, right? It's a more interesting robot. 
Now this problem of multiple configurations mapping to the same end effector position is much more pronounced, right? In fact, if you live in a 2D world and you have three joints, generally speaking, um, you're gonna have an infinite number of ways to get your gripper to the same boat. Right? What does this space look like if this robot has three joints? It's, we can't really look at it anymore. Um, but it's three-dimensional, right? What if it has four joints? How many dimensions is that? Five, six, seven, you can see where this is going. So the problem is that a lot of interesting robots are gonna have six, seven-dimensional arms. Um, humanoid robots are gonna have as many as 30, 40 dimensions to them. So remember how DFS or BFS, well, let's talk about DFS, is searching this volume that increases, right? Well, now that volume exists in a higher dimensional space. So it's much worse to search a sphere than it is to search a circle, right? This problem gets exponentially worse as the number of dimensions goes up. That's a problem in robots called the curse of dimensionality. Curse is, uh, it's hard. So maybe these uninformed searches are not going to be the right algorithm for solving these problems when your dimensionality gets higher. Does that make sense? So next time we'll talk about how to guide your search based on where the goal is or some knowledge of your relationship to the goal at any given time. Um, and that'll cut that problem down substantially. So let's call it there and I will see you guys on Tuesday.